The information discussed on Pocket Money with Jeff Tarbell is believed to be from reliable sources. However, no responsibility is assumed for inaccuracies. No statement made on this broadcast should be construed as a specific recommendation of a particular investment product. Views expressed are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent those of CBS Radio. News only is directed. Smiles, everyone. Smiles. And prepare yourself for... Show me the money! Ladies and gentlemen... The radio broadcast experience designed to keep your wallet in top condition. It's Talking Money with Jeff Tarbell. Talking Money. Talking Money. More money, more money, more money. And now entering the studio, your guru for fiscal fitness, Jeff Tarbell. Right, right. How you doing? Good morning. We have uh, made it our way up here. Actually, this is almost as easy as driving in the studio this morning. <laughs> we are uh, live at Sierra Tahoe, sitting out on the deck. And as you can, as I'll show John here, look at the yeah. socks. <laughs> the dumbass. I ask, maybe they have Sierra Tahoe <laughs> boots we could borrow too. <laughs> it's actually, actually, the sun is creeping toward us, so it'll it'll warm up here a little bit too. It is actually beautiful up here today. I uh, didn't fully read the memo that was afforded to me you'll be out on the deck and uh, for some reason i was thinking out on the deck in maui so i, sh- <laughs> I showed up in ped socks and uh levi's and a and in a, a uh, not not a warm enough shirt but anyway we we, we scrounged up some that's just some pretty nice gear john very nice spider sierra tahoe employee gear i say we cut out about five minutes early go we're gonna be we're gonna go to the best the restroom we'll be right back and we haul we haul ass out of here and we'll right. keep the keep the gear so Anyway, thanks to them for uh, inviting us out. And there's been a lot of new things up here um, at Sierra. You know, we're sitting out on a kind of a whole new section that's being built and plaza and re- deck rebuilt. Yeah, so they're trying to get get some nice atmosphere going here at the at the resort. We'll talk about that in our last segment today, as we have some of the men and women from Sierra join us on uh, on the air here for the uh, final segment today. And uh, of course, we are giving out Sierra Tahoe ski passes. For our quiz winners today, John's got a couple uh, fairly easy questions, and uh, we'll take those if you'd like at 339-1140, 1-800-920-1140. You can text us at 441140. There's also a lot open up here. There's uh, quite a few runs in the front, and the West Bowl is all open from top to bottom. Yeah, for for not having had a lot of snow year to date, you look on sitting where we are here, you wouldn't know that. And even driving up, I mean, it started from Placerville on up. There's a lot more than I thought. Yeah, there was a lot of snow coming up, but the roads are clear, so... Come on and get it. Uh, get your early season ski legs in. It won't be the, the deep pow ski today, but you'll be uh, good warm-up runs, and quite frankly, that will probably be plenty <laughs> this time of year. That's so right. We'll give you some passes if you want to do that, too. Um, full phone line is open today, and we've got uh, some quiz questions for you, some things to give away, and some fun things to talk about. I did um, see a lot of things happen this week, one of them which was in the market. It's peers, you know, knock on wood, that our maybe our our economic recovery is maybe for real. I want to believe that. I really do. I want to believe it. Um, I'll believe it when I see it. But we're starting to see some movement toward uh, the the federal government believing that things are getting better, and a whole lot of talk this week about the beginning of the end of uh, quantitative easing, which doesn't mean any, anything to you other than it means government pumping money artificially stimulating parts of the economy, uh, buying bonds, uh, buying mortgage-backed securities, and doing things like that to help to help uh, things you know push things along a little bit. The problem with that program, it's gone on long enough now that people forgot what it was like when we didn't have that program, and you get a little bit of a panic when people say, oh, oh, oh what does that mean when they're going to stop pumping in, you know, pumping in money into the economy? So we'll, I guess we'll figure out what it means. I know what it means for interest rates. And we saw that this week a little bit, too. Even yeah. though the discussion so far has not been around ending buying the mortgage-backed securities or the bonds for home loans, when people, whenever people say they just we're going to stop buying bonds, I think they think everything. But nonetheless, it's, it's all going to come to an end at some point. It has to come to an end at some point. It needs to. It needs to come to an end at some point. You're right. So we saw a little bit of market correction this week, the first probably not-so-good market for the Dow. And uh, rates early in the week kind of pulling themselves up a little bit uh, by, was it Thursday or Friday, saw a little bit of an improvement? And then lost it all mostly. Did you? Okay. So you can, you can see that people always ask me, well, you know, I'm going to wait around, or what do you think rates will be, you know, next year? I mean, 
if I'm betting 99% higher and 1% lower, and um, and so that's I think that's just going to be the the way it is as as the market starts to try to get itself back into a normal market-driven, not government-driven economy. So if you're thinking, sitting around thinking that uh, at least on the mortgage rate end of things, they're, they're going to get better, uh, I have to say that they're still very, very good. They're still in the mid fo- mid to high fours, depending on you know what you're doing. And you're going to look back in that in five years and go, oh, my God, mid, mid to high fours was phenomenal. I can't believe it when you're at 6 and 7%. And that will be the new normal. Right. But um, in the interim, it's going to be a little bit of a, st- a little bit of a payment shock or mental shock, I guess, for people as it's they start. It's going to be a shock, no move, doubt. Move there. Uh, another little bit of news this week that kind of kind of came out of nowhere. Did, did you see the uh, Democrats and Republicans both agreed on something? Did see that. And you always know that it probably wasn't too bad of a deal when both sides think it was a hell of a bad deal. I mean, neither one of them were happy, which is probably you know, like they call it divorce when both people leave the unhappy. You probably, the judge probably got it right. Um, both sides probably didn't want a political mess on their hands again with another sh- government shutdown. Nobody came out of that smelling good, and so they decided to resolve something and get it done. Now, whether that means it was good for you and I, the taxpayer down the road, I don't know, but I do know that it was better than nothing, and we actually have a true budget and something moving forward. So that was good. I can tell you that on December 28th, there's going to be about uh, 1.3 million people in the United States are going to think it wasn't such a good deal. And uh, the White House estimates that roughly 1.3 million workers will stop receiving unemployment payments when the program ends December 28th. So they are going to put an end to the continual extension of unemployment benefits. And uh, there's probably half of you that are clapping and, and 1.3 million of you or more that are not so happy. Um, I think it leads to the beginning of a more normal economy. And I think it leads to people saying, okay, I no longer can I count on assistance, so I'm going to have to get up and do something. And I'm going to have to go out and get a job. And I, you know, you hear all the time there's no jobs out there. There's lots of jobs out there that pay better than unemployment do. And Sometimes it's just easier to sit back and collect it's a, unemployment. It's a hell of a lot easier in some cases to do that. And, and if people are willing to send you the check, then uh, you know people are willing to accept it, and and I, I firmly believe in unemployment as a temporary measure, but what what we have had has been, I think, ridiculous. Absolutely. Uh, and, and what happens is, you know, and, and if you say that, you, you you get accused of being, you know, a, a callous individual, or you don't know what it's like on the side. What what I know for a fact that happens is you become complacent. You become unfamiliar and uh, out of the workplace long enough that you lose the habit of getting up and going to work and, and continually trying to improve yourself and get the next job and and you know you, you just get out of the hook, out of the habit of doing anything. And I, I mean I'll tell you right now, I haven't skied in almost nine months. I'm out of the habit. I'm looking around going, that looks like a lot of work. And I love skiing. <laughs> you know, so you you kind of um, if you forget how to go to work and you forget that motivation, um, you you quickly become unemployable. And if you've been out of work or and drawing unemployment or just not, even not in drawing unemployment for over a year or more, you know, your your skill level drops. And it's just, I mean, unless you're retired, it's not good. So I'm, I'm glad to see that, that, that there is going to be some pressure to get people back up and, and moving around. And more people working and creating income and creating, you know, creating opportunity for themselves is good for the economy and i think the people will spend more if they're with they're working as opposed to getting a, a check handed to them my thoughts may be wrong and it might be the right timing you know with uh more jobs coming about we know that employment numbers are changing and then there's different opportunities so you know 2014 maybe the year to get off unemployment get out there and start making the path yep i hope so so if you uh disagree with that or you're someone who has been collecting unemployment and that's not easy to call and say hey jeff i I've been collecting unemployment. That's not that's not something I know that even if you're getting it, you're you're generally proud of. You can call and use your another name. But if, if you're if I'm off base there, I'd love to hear from you. You're welcome to chime in and, and set me straight. It won't be the first time or the last time. Three three nine eleven forty, and you can text us at forty four eleven forty. I do not have access to text here visually, but Chris down there in the studio can um, can read them off to us and uh, and get us going. And Chris, don't forget, I didn't forget you, Chris, on the, on the. Uh, one minute from Christopher Lodge. So we'll get Chris's one minute before we go to the, the first break today and get his thoughts on things. So that was the, uh, we got a unexpected immediate um, budget put together. I, I don't, 
Did you hear whether I don't think it's been signed yet, but I think it's proposed and sent over to sent over to the Senate. So that's good. Um, I did see the U.S. government is out of government motors now. We are no longer car owners anymore. We have sold off General Motors, and the minute we sold it off, um, trading went up and the stock went up about 30 cents a share in late trading. So how much did we make on our investment? How much did we make? We made. A negative 10.5 billion, or in real terms, we lost 10 billion dollars on that deal, and certainly our governments lost more money than that on other ventures. Uh, you take the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and FHA, and some of the other housing debacles. We we have invested billions of dollars in those things, and actually, fingers crossed, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have actually paid back all their money now. And we'll start making money. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that a little more in the second break. There's some changes coming to those programs as well. But uh, all of you that are out buying a house now or refinancing now with a conventional Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan are paying back the tab for either yourself earlier <laughs> when you defaulted <laughs> or for your neighbor when they walked away from their house and some of the other losses too. Those are being recouped at a rapid pace by Fannie and Freddie. So they're getting their money back. But $10 billion lost on the General Motors transaction. We are now out of the business. I think that's good that we're out. Um, I don't know if I have an opinion or not or whether that was a good deal. I, I, I don't think I have enough background and experience to say, okay, had we let General Motors close, what would that have meant you know, economically to the, to the whole country? We had a lot of people unemployed. We would had a lot of factories shut down. There would have been a lot of business loss. My guess is we would have lost more than $10 million in volume over the years. Hello, Chris. Well, it says we're connecting. We're, good. Uh, we're back on there. I'm not sure where we dropped off. So I, I apologize. That, that happens a little bit up here as you get a little bit of spotty communication. But, the sun uh, started coming up. So. No, it is. It started to warm up a little bit. Yeah. Hey, Chris, why don't you uh, give us your – John, throw your quiz question. We'll get our first quiz question out. Chris can give us his uh, one minute from the mind of Christopher Laud, and we'll uh, take a break here on the first break. Okay, so quiz question, first one of the day is uh, you see the Rocky Balboa. Uh, I'm not sure what the name of the movie is, but uh, sequel, I'm not even sure it was, what you call it. It was, Rocky, it was Rocky 1, wasn't it? Or Rocky 2? Rocky 1, I believe. So the question is, and actually in Rocky 2, so when Rocky Balboa does his run through the streets of Philadelphia, is probably uh, it looks like a couple few miles. But what is the if you mapped it all out, how long was Rocky Balboa's run up to the art studio steps in in actual miles or kilometers? How far was that run that was shown in the movie? Yeah, because the movie the movie's only like a couple minute segment, right? Right. But they, someone went and tracked it all out. That's okay. right. So how many kilometers or miles was it? That is the question. Three three nine eleven forty, one eight hundred. 1140 if you want to answer that. Hey, Chris, you still ready there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, so give us give us the – I skipped over you because I always do that when I'm alive, I'm alive on the road. Give us the uh, – what's the 60 seconds on your mind, and we'll go to break after that. What's up in your world down there? Uh, well, uh, I've been working the Kings games, and uh, a lot of people, as soon as the uh, big trade came up, were saying, oh, my God, this uh, this team's going to the playoffs. And I, <laughs> I didn't quite get that. <laughs> And then they go and just get destroyed by two teams, and people are like, oh, my God, this is the worst decision ever. What are they doing? They're making moves just to make them. Well, you now have four players that have about – you have one player who's been here for about two weeks in Derek Williams, and then in the Toronto trade, you've had three players who just practiced two days ago for the very first time with this team. Exactly. So, so it's going to take time for everyone to gel. It's going to take time to know where people like the ball, where people want to go. So everyone just calm down a little bit. No one thought that this team was going to make the playoffs to begin with. I don't know why you would think they would, they're they going to make it now. So everyone just cool your jets for uh, for uh, a month or two. And that's it, if you guys can still hear me. Yeah, I got you. I got you. All right, so our quiz question is, how far did Rocky run in the uh, – I think it was Ro the Rocky 1 movie. The one where he goes – the famous one, he's going up the steps there. They actually tracked out all the places he was at. And uh, how many kilometers, how many miles it was the actual Rocky run, if you were to do it yourself? 339-1140, 1-800-340-1140. 
One eight hundred nine two zero eleven forty. You can text us at forty four eleven forty for a pair of, for a ski pass to Sierra Tahoe, or some round table pizza. My name's Jeff Tarbell. This is John Fodero. We're live at Sierra Tahoe, and we'll be right back, Jack. Talking money. Talking money. Well, all righty then. We're back to talking money with Jeff Tarbell. Yeah, that's us. You see a little thing there as it goes into the red. I think we're. Tra- I think that, that might be part of our problem there. But maybe we're just talking too loud. I don't know. We are here warming up at Sierra at Tahoe. That's right. My apologies in advance if uh, this thing starts to crackle in and out a little bit. It does automatically re- reconnect to itself. So if we lose you, we'll be back in a few seconds. But I, th- I think we got it figured out. I don't know. Professionals. Maybe the sections where we're actually not on the air is, could be considered the best of section <laughs> of the day. So a couple of things I wanted to bring up that I've been carrying around for a little bit, and some of we've been dis- discussing. Do you remember the? Um, oh, d- oh, I'm sorry. Did we get a quiz? We did get some some winners to okay. the quiz question, which was in the movie Rocky, actually yeah. Rocky one and two, where uh, Rocky Balboa does the run. Yeah, okay. If he actually did that whole run, how far would it be? 10k. A little more. So t- I don't know how much 10k is. All I know is I can't run it. <laughs> so what, what what did you come About up with? About 50 kilometers or Ooh. 31 miles. 51k run. Uh, Rocky would be a lot skinnier if he if he actually made that run. So we did get some winners to that, to the 50K run from Rocky Elbow. It's warm up here. I'm getting hot. It's nice. Huh? <laughs> so, hey, I, um, a couple things I had brought up. You remember when we were discussing the 23 and me? Yes. You send in a sample, and they give you all the things that could be wrong with you. Or all the things that are wrong with you. Oh, oh yeah. That's an easy list for me, just to check the boxes where. I, I We talked about that a couple weeks ago, and I, I, I picked up an opinion or editorial out of the Sacramento newspaper, and it was interesting. It said... Uh, some things I hadn't thought about, but it doesn't really bother me. But one of the beliefs for the 23andMe is that it is creating a gigantic genetic database that they can sell to drug companies and researchers to develop cures that can be patented, basically a biobank. And it's a way for 23andMe to monetize your information about you to other companies. Back-end um, money. Yeah, so my question is this. First off, we're not forced to send in our samples to 23andMe, and quite frankly, if I send it in and, and they they find out that I have a tendency for some disease, and they, they, they reference to Crohn's disease or whatever in here, then I would want companies to market to me who are trying to re, trying to cure that particular problem and say, hey, Jeff, we think this might be apply to you. You want to t- you know talk to us about it? I don't care. It's, it's, it's fine. It's like me saying I have a 9% interest rate. People, mortgage people are going to call me and say, would you like to, get, you like four, to, re- so to get four and a half? So, uh, I, it, again, I don't, I don't get This is not a mandated thing. If people want to voluntarily send their information in and pay a fee to this company and, and their information is being shared, I guess that's one of the uh, – I mean, I think right now all of our information is being shared. You tell me that Google doesn't know where I was yesterday on the computer and, and different things, too. That's all being shared and sold. So I, I don't know. I don't know what the big panic is. Um, so that was one thing I, I brought up that I thought was interesting. This one I thought was fascinating. And – you don't have to be so. One of my whole, uh, this is a full page BP uh, British Petroleum um, page out of the Wall Street Journal, and there's one of these almost every single day in the paper. And obviously, BP was in part responsible for the Gulf oil spill, and they have done a very good job about pointing out. Um, issues in the in the Gulf oil spill with the settlement and how money is being completely wasted. And there's a full article in here about a company that was awarded a half a million dollars from this fund, and nobody could demonstrate that they even had anything to do with being a loss during the spill or having any kind of problem or or or, or even claim to money from the spill. And this pub, this is a big multinational company who received a half a million dollars from the fund. For, for basically what BP alleges is they weren't even involved or around. They just filed a claim and someone issued them some money. So I, I, I find it, I think it's cool. I, I don't think it's cool that BP, that there was an oil spill. I don't think that's cool at all. I think it's cool that BP is saying, hey, look, it, if you're going to make us put up all this money, let's find people who deserve it. Let's not reward companies and people that are just making false claims. And they, they have gone out of the point out where they think they're getting really screwed over. By the courts and different people too. So I don't know if you if you catch the Wall Street Journal, if you ever catch those articles, read one of them, one time. The BP is spending a lot of marketing money saying, "Hey, this money isn't going to the people that were hurt. This money's going to whoever happens to get a claim stuck in there." I thought that was pretty uh, pretty interesting deal. 
Um, one more thing I, I didn't notice. If you're going to do some remodeling of your home in California, you might want to get that permit pulled before the end of the year. My apologies, this is as frustrating for you as it is for us. I don't know why they, we have a good connection. I don't know why it's doing that. But um, if you're going to pull a permit on a remodel on your home, get it pulled before the end of the year. The state of California has come up with a new rule now that if you're going to remodel anything in your house, as I read this, all of your water fixtures have to be replaced. So shower heads, faucets, even if you're not doing a plumbing project, as I understand it. And it's not your local county who the county's not for this either, I don't think. Um, this is a water conservation statewide. I think the, the original bill was written by a gentleman out of uh, Southern California. So anyway, right now, if you're going to have to do some remodel work on your home, you're going to have to replace all your fixtures to low flow. And if you start thinking about adding up toilets and faucets and you know, shower heads and everything else too, if you're not planning to do them, it gets real expensive real quick. But that's not getting into sprinklers, right? No, that, the sprinklers is a different issue. That's that there is a, there is an issue with sprinklers. Sprinklers is a fire suppression issue, which is um, already in place in many many areas, particularly rural counties. But this is just for water, you know, for water conservation. And I think what it leads to is it just leads to more people not pulling a permit. You say, okay, well, I'm, I, I want to you know put in new tile or, or something in you know in a new kitchen. Fine, I'll replace the kitchen sink, but I don't want to replace the entire household full of uh, of kitchen items. I, I mean, I think it's going to be an, a problem. So not to digress, but if Tommy Hilfinger's co-founder, Joel Horowitz, yeah, his 20,000-square-foot home that just sold up in uh, Zephyr Cove area, yeah, if he wanted to do a little remodel, he might have some issues with that. Well, he's in Nevada. Okay. He's good. Well, there you go. He's good. That's why one of the houses are more valuable there because you don't have to do quite as much stuff. But, yeah, he, how many bedrooms and bathrooms does he have or did it have? More than, hey, if you can afford 210 it. acre property, 20,000 square foot uh, stone home, 19 theater seat movie theater, but it did it did go. It was listed originally for 100 million. Oh, just sold for 48 million. Oh, that's a steal. Yeah, it's, it's on its own private so, lake. So th this is a marketing strategy we all need to adopt for selling our house right now. So John, even though I know you don't want to sell your house, but let's say that I you wanted to sell your house, I say you start out at 1.3 million. And you accept 600 grand, 50% off. I tell you, what I'm, gonna do, I'm gonna make a deal right now. I gotta be out by the end of the week. 600 grand, even if the house only appraises for 450, you're getting it for a deal. Because I was originally asking 1.3 million. It's like Black Friday all over again. <laughs> exactly like Black Friday. So we, that's a new strategy. I will be adopting that from the future. If you want to buy my house, currently I'm not selling, but it's on the market for 48 million dollars, and I will take half at any point in time. So give me a call if you'd like to do that too. I think we've got to take another break here. Yeah, yeah, we do in a minute. So. We got a couple of guests coming on. We got another quiz question there for us. We do. So we were talking a little bit about Mandela. Well, he yeah. uh, passed away, and there's a lot going on down there in Africa. Yep. But since we like to eat, yeah. Our question is, how much? Because there's a lot of a lot of different companies going into Africa. I saw that. Like Johnny Rockets was moving in there. Johnny or? Rockets, a whole bunch of different companies. But so, how much is your hamburger going to cost in Africa? So like I, I mean, like you, everything on it, right? Everything on it. We're cheese, talking uh, cheese, lettuce, tomato, the whole, the whole, the whole deal there. Tomato, cheese, ground beef, even lettuce. So give me, give me what you, what they figure is the what's the average price in the United States for a burger? Do they? About five fifty. Okay, five forty nine. So, so five fifty is your base price. So what is the African fully loaded hamburger going to run with uh, if you walk into Carl's Jr. or Johnny Rockets in a in an African restaurant? Three three nine eleven forty, one eight hundred nine two zero eleven forty. You can text us at forty four eleven forty. This is Talking Money. We're live at Sierra Tahoe. Hopefully you can still hear us. We can hear you. The sun is coming out. It is going to be drop-dead gorgeous up here today if you want to get your ski legs worked back up. We'll give you some ski passes if you can answer our question correctly. My name is Jeff Tarbell. This is John Federero. And we're going to be right back, Jack. Money. And we're back to talking money. And here's Jeff Tarbell. 
Right, right. We are back. Final segment of the day. How you doing? Hopefully our phone will hang in there a little bit. We uh, did not get a winner of that, John, so I'm going to do a, a plan B, but but the, I guess the everybody's guessing way too low. Too low? Yeah, so if you're going to uh, go to a Carl's Jr. or Johnny Rockets or something in Africa, how much are you going to pay for a burger there? Go ahead. You want me to tell you? Sure. Really? Yeah. 14 bucks. Oh. 14 bucks, because the you, lettuce is expensive. Well, what if you, see, this is the problem. They're, they're billing me for 14. I don't want to let, let lettuce on my burger. What if I get it without? I don't think they'll give me a discount. So fourteen dollars for a burger in Africa, huh? Maybe they, so it's not the meat. I guess they have the meat over there. They just don't have any, any fresh, any fresh veggies. Yeah, part of it's the beef supply, and then the shipping of fresh vegetables and such. Definitely yeah, a they're challenge. Not, not so fresh when they get there across the country. That's right. So we didn't get a winner to that because everybody was guessing too low. So this is what I'll do: the uh, next three callers who have not won something this year, you have not won anything this year from this radio show. And you would like to come up to Sierra Tahoe and get in some skiing or some boarding, or you can just sit on your butt like I'm doing on the deck today and enjoy the sun. Well, up to you. Uh, three three nine eleven forty. Here's the quiz question: You have to know your name and your address. And this is going to be a challenge for a lot of you on a Saturday. I get it. But uh, if you can figure out those two things and you have not won something this year, give Chris a call right now. Three three nine eleven forty. Or you can text him if you want at forty four eleven forty. Make sure you text all the proper information there, and Chris will get you on the list and we'll get you a Sierra Tahoe ski pass. You can get up here. And getting some runs, uh, ASAP. Speaking of that, Steve uh, Hemphill's back. How you doing? Fantastic. How are you guys doing? Absolutely incredible day up here at Sierra Tahoe. It's a bluebird, beautiful day. We just mentioned it's warming up very rapidly, but conditions are incredible up here at the moment. So make sure you get up here. Yeah, so we John and I were coming when we walked up. Where we were sitting now was kind of, it was kind of all dirt and snow before, and so there's a lot of stuff going that way. What are you guys doing here? Yeah, we put a $5 million um, investment in here to the base area. What it is is, you know, it's a, we put a plaza in really just enhancing the overall guest experience, really looking to enhance the apre atmosphere, um, get people to stay a little bit longer, hang out. Um, as you guys know, from a financial standpoint, it's a great opportunity for us here at Sierra Tahoe to capitalize. And um, we're really excited about what's going on, get a new retail location, kind of have it more up front and center, as well as another food and beverage outlet. Um, it will showcase some beautiful, amazing, really local cuisine, um, fresh meat, all that stuff, um, farm to table type stuff. So we're excited about that. Um, you know, a little different than what we were just talking about, fast food burgers, but yeah. um, for it is, it's going to be incredible. And we're really excited. It, again, just really kind of a facelift for the resort that's been needed here um, and we're excited to bring it and give our guests more value with everything that they do so what are your predictions for uh, for this season we are optimistic we are optimistic so that last last weekend we saw a great great um you know 32 inches and we're able to open up a ton of terrain here at the resort we're optimistic that storms will come it looks like the forecast, what it's going to do is uh, hopefully bring us a little bit more snow before the holiday season, allowing um, people that are coming up for Christmas, New Year's, and give us a great product for them. So. Yeah, we use uh, all natural snow up here at Sierra. We have a few supplemental snow making guns. Um, however, you know, that's just to fill in some bare patches. But yeah, we rely on Mother Nature. And like I said, we're optimistic about what's to come. I was, I was telling John, I was reading this article about the Sochi Olympics. And, you know, if you're, it's one thing to plan a, a, a ski weekend for people to come up with ski. It's another thing to plan to have the whole world watching you. And just looking at some of the you know, snow making capabilities that they've come up with. I mean, making snow as high as 15, I mean, 59 degrees, being able to make snow in Russia if they have to. And they actually took snow from last year and stored it inside a mountain, you know, and so they could have enough snow throughout the year. They're worried, you know, over there. They're not going to have, obviously, if you're hosting the Winter Olympics, it would help if you had a little snow. Yeah, Van Vancouver ran into the same uh, issue did. a few years back, um, kind of tried to get a lot of stuff closer to Vancouver, and I think they quickly realized that was a mistake, but... Um, we're, you know, speaking about the Olympics, we have athletes at the moment in uh, Colorado. Um, Sierra, we sponsor some athletes that are doing absolutely fantastic, top 
top Olympic qualifiers, we have Kyle Smain, Jamie Anderson, and Maddie Bowman, who are all Olympic hopefuls, as well as Hannah Teeter, a former gold medalist. Mm -hmm. So we're excited about the Olympics, and it's going to be great for the sport. It's a great opportunity to showcase the winter sports scene. I was, I've been carrying this article around for a while. I thought it was just so cool. And I, and I don't know why. Well, I, I guess I do know why because it's awfully expensive. But the, these are, the, this was out of the Wall Street Journal. It was talking about all the places you could ski all year round. And, you know, Dubai is very very familiar with it. But this this one here in Germany I thought was super cool. But you start, start asking yourself, you've got a facility here, as there are many of them up here in Tahoe, that half of the year at a minimum sit around and don't do anything. And, you know, developing this, you know, I'm pointing to the one here in Germany, you can see here, kind of this indoor ski run here. And these are all solar panels on top, and then you can you know, take the normal chairlift up and you ski down indoors and run one run a whole run. Now, I don't know what these things cost, but I can certainly see, particularly some of the bigger corporations that own these resorts, of coming up with some, some way to monetize their facility in the summer. And you start getting into, you know, a poor weather year and having, you know, the ability to do some, to do some skiing and some training. You know, year long, I think I think would be fantastic. I don't know when you're going to see it in the United States. You don't see it anywhere in the United States, maybe because we have such ample opportunities to ski. But these these kind of ideas, I think, are just so cool. They're, yeah, and they're they're popping up all over the world. There's a actually a young gentleman from the UK who will be competing in the Olympics, um, a slope style skier who learned to ski on dry slope is what they call it in the UK. But um, you know, it's in, it's interesting. I know there's a push at the moment, actually, for the Bay Area to get um, a dry slope. As I saw well. that, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, from a s standpoint of an operationally, you know, the, the plaza that we just mentioned a bit earlier is a great opportunity for Sierra Tahoe to get a year-round uh, piece of uh, land where we can use it year-round and utilize it and make money off it. So we're excited about that, but, um, you know, you always have mountain biking, you have a lot of a plethora of opportunities in the summer um, that some resorts up here, more so than us here at Sierra Tahoe, though, um, will utilize the mountain for summer enjoyment as well. What um, what, have you, what, what are the have you guys? It seems like there's a deal you guys teamed up with some people for some ski passes. What are some of the kind of the deals you guys are running now? For different pass opportunities or multi-use facilities or what are those what's going on here with you guys yeah again we uh, you know giving value to our pass holders is a huge deal for us here at sierra tahoe and um we've partnered with 11 other resorts all along the west coast this uh, this season um it's called the powder alliance it's an awesome opportunity if you know the ultimate road trip is what we're calling it but yeah. nice a lot a lot of gems there throughout the west coast you have snow basin which is in utah crest of butte in colorado crest of butte by the way just won the one of those online uh, yeah, number the, one the number ski four. town throwdown yeah, yeah. Ski town throwdown it's number one that. so that would be a good one to check out yeah absolutely it's an amazing resort um as well as timberline is Stevens Pass in Washington. So, you know, you have a plethora of opportunities um, when it comes to skiing elsewhere. And then we've also partnered with Squaw and Alpine on the north side of the lake to give our pass holders kind of that north shore, south shore uh, combination. So that comes. If, so you have to buy that specific pass. It's not with just any season passes. That yeah. After? So our unlimited pass is what it's called. The unlimited pass gets you the Powder Alliance, is where uh, the any Sierra pass will get you the Squaw and Alpine benefits. So okay. Great partnership we have going with them, and as well as you know they see the benefits of it because uh, any silver or above pass holder at Squaw gets to ski at Sierra all year round. So and, and what is a what is a pass cost right now for uh, for an adult? Three eighty nine. So it's un it's un it's unreal, you know. Value was one of our big things here at Sierra. We want to make sure we understand up front that skiing and snowboarding, you know, is a tough financially tough thing to get into. Um, so we offer, you know, a season pass at a great price. We offer a forty-five dollar learn to ski and ride package, that. which incredible. is insane. So um, what it is is a two and a half hour lesson, rentals and lift ticket for $45. So yeah. get up here. You know, we really want to see people get on the slopes. Lake Tahoe is absolutely incredible. Um, so we want people to be out in the mountains enjoying everything that there is to offer. And I'll tell you just from a former ski instructor and someone who, John, I ski all the time, the, these are the kind of days where you, it's, it's, it's nice to come out because you can get up here without there, any weather problems. The parking is parked right up front. There's not huge crowds. You can get up and down the lifts. You can get some runs in. You can actually you know, either develop some skills or refresh some skills without having to be, you know, overwhelmed with the holiday traffic. It is it, these are the kind of days I always love. It's, you know, everybody else is thinking about doing something else, and you get up there and you know, get a few runs in. But for 45 bucks, 
if you've never skied before, uh, uh, guaranteed number one way to divorce is have your husband or boyfriend teach you how to ski or <laughs> have your wife or your girlfriend teach you how to ski. Uh, that will guarantee that you will not be um, – Doing anything else after the evening is over because the, you know, that's just it's just a, a not a good way. You learn bad habits right off the bat. So for 45 bucks, which is probably less than the cost of the ticket, um, to come and get the gear and, and, and just come up here and, and get a lesson it is it is the way to go. There's no question about it. And you start this is a financial show. You want to start talking about a pass? You know, you start taking to just divide up a one day ticket and figure out you know the break even is probably four or five days. And now with you being able to go, uh, you know, the North Tahoe or if you want the pass, it goes up and down the, the West Coast. Uh, you can get your money back in a heartbeat. Yeah, yeah and we offer some other great p- um, packages and things such as a three pack, where you know you for fifty five dollars a day, one sixty five total, but you get three days. It's basically kind of a three day season pass. Uh huh. Um, can be used consecutively, so it's a great, um, you know, hey, I'm up here for New Year's, up here for Christmas, won't be back in the region. Um, and or, you know, it's a great opportunity to use it intermittently throughout the season. They don't have to be used consecutively. And best part about it, no blackout dates. So come on up on the holidays when you're coming with your friends and family. But again, $55 a day. And our day rate at the moment is uh, $84. So it's kind of, an, you know, it's one of those things. Not, I don't, wouldn't, wouldn't go as far as saying a no-brainer, but yeah. um, definitely a great opportunity. Yeah. Also on the uh, lessons and stuff, so I know the Star Wars program, if it's still called that for the kids, so you can drop your kids off, put them in a great learning ability, and you go out and ski and ride all day long. Yep, yeah, we have the Burton Star Wars experience, which we're extremely excited. We've actually expanded that this season. Um, It used to be just three to six-year-olds. Now it's three through 12. Um, What we do there is it's incredible. We're actually the only one in the world currently um, that we've partnered with Lucasfilm as well as Burton Snowboards, and what we do is... We put the kids through a narrative where they start as Padawans and younglings. Um, that's Star Wars terms there. Um, but what we do is we put them through a narrative and teach them to become Jedi Knights um, and defeat the dark side of snowboarding. So, Sweet. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. We have some life-size, actual two-scale uh, wood carvings of a lot of the iconic scare, uh, characters from Star Wars. Um, we just got two new ones this year, Darth Vader and uh, Luke Skywalker. So is, it, is that boarding only or is it skiing too? It is, it is snowboarding only. We've worked with Burton Snowboards pretty closely on that. Um, so we, it's a snowboarding opportunity, but it's a great, you know, you hear people all in, in the moment in the ski industry are talking about the decline of snowboarding. Here at Sierra, snowboarding is a big deal for us, and we're actually proactively trying to get more and more people involved in the sport. You're going to see a continual flip-flop between ski board and ski board because you'll do whatever your parents didn't do. <laughs> because, That's so because, true. So Very true. So now you're seeing you're seeing all the guys that were 20-somethings and they're now 30-somethings that were all boarders. Now they're they're having kids, and their kids are starting to learn to ski. And they're like, well, my dad boards. I'm not doing boarding. I'm going to go back to skiing because it's cool. And quite frankly, all the new skis are so cool because they, they all learn from the boards. So hey, just, but I tried it and I got laughed at. You got at what? <laughs> Trying to ski again. No, I wasn't laughing at you. <laughs> I said it was humorous. I wasn't laughing at you. I was laughing with you. Yeah, it's either one. We just say, you know, is whatever you're sliding on, it's it's a good time. And again, it's more so just being outside, being in the Sierras, and um, enjoying the outdoors is and, what and we're all about. And this new is is called the Plaza Deck, or what? Yep, are, it's what just the Plaza. We're kind of going with the Plaza. The um, the food and beverage outlet will be called the Solstice, and then we'll have Sierra Mountain Sports, which is our retail, moving up here a little bit. Um, but again, it's a the Plaza is a great place to come up. We're going to be doing very Sierra-esque things this throughout the season. We're going to have a cornhole league. So not go. sure not sure what your cornhole skills are like, but we invite you to come up to Sierra and test them out. We'll have cornhole live concert series this spring that we're going to be doing, which we're excited about, and then. Um, again, mentioning the Olympics, we're going to be going hard with our, our athletes in the Olympics. We'll be uh, having a jumbotron live broadcasting the Olympics and what they're all about. So, Sweet. yeah, just it's good, it gives us a great point for entertainment and getting people up here and having a good time. So, what, what what's kind of the ETA? I mean, it looks like a lot of stuff's got a good start on it. Some of it looks like it's clearly going. What, what do you guys expect? At yeah, least so this first phase will be done. The, the tent is good. The tent is good to go, um, and we're excited about that. Um, but MLK will be the official opening weekend, um, so we'll have everything set, squared away, and ready to roll. Perfect. So if you're looking for uh, your ski pass, and I'll tell you right now, growing up as a kid, my favorite, favorite gift was always from my grandma who bought me a, uh, 
you know, a ski pass. Actually, we used to have Alpine Junior skiers as kids, and they'd bring you. We had to go, you had to go up to Boreal at the time, but but a ski pass is a phenomenal way to get as a gift if you don't know what to give another skier. Nobody will ever complain about that. So, Steve, we appreciate your time very much, and once again, I can't uh, thank you and the folks this here enough for giving us some ski passes. We give them all out. I mean, they they give them to John, and John, we we make an effort to getting everything out and uh, into the public so people can get out and experience it. And uh, so there's a lot of people that just cannot wait for the ski season with us to, to win and some so path. for you in the valley who think there's no snow up here, that's an untruth. Yeah, that's, there's, there's no question about it. I was you know, actually, like we mentioned, you'll see it from Placerville on up. It's, uh, but there's, there's plenty of snow up here and a great way to kind of get up and get your legs warmed back up. And we, we request that you keep snow dancing, though. So don't yeah, stop yeah. those snow right, dances. Absolutely. Keep, yeah. wa- keep washing your car, whatever it is. Pray, that you... pray to Uller. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, again, winter has definitely arrived in the Sierras, and uh, we invite everyone to come on up and check it out. Appreciate it very much. Right on. Good to have you again, and we'll uh, hopefully we'll see you next year, too. And, and uh, make sure John and I get these jackets back before we leave, because these are, I, we could cut right in line. And say, we're, we're, we're ski patrol. <laughs> They'll figure out. Absolutely, well. you guys look good in those. Yeah, we look like almost like we, we had a real job, which would be a fallacy because we do not work for a living. <laughs> so that gets, how are we doing on time down there, Chris? On your end there. Okay, we're down in the last couple minutes. So I'll wrap up. You know, for those of you who tuned in last week, I had uh, Porter Fox as an author uh, writing a book, wrote a book called Powder. I did put a link to that on the uh, Talk of Money Facebook page and on the jefftarbell.com website because um, it's a it's a fascinating book and I totally totally blew it last week and um, appreciate it Steve thank you and I, I brought him on too late and we just just started to get into we, we kind of discussed all the things leading up to not enough snow and we just started to get into what are the you know what are the resorts going to do and, and I didn't get that so I'm going to have I'm going to have Porter come back uh, and do that do the part B of that uh, interview when we get a chance but um, his book is phenomenal, and if you're just someone who likes just the history of skiing and just kind of some of the some of the great stories around it, uh, pick it up and read it because it's it's really a fun uh, a fun read to do that. And the book's called Powder. Um, next Saturday, I'm going to be rebroadcasting an interview I did, and I want to say it was probably 2004 or five. I mean, early early on in, in doing this show. Um, I had uh, Buzz Oates came on with and Phil Oates, who listens to the station regularly, um, to KHDK, and is a huge King supporter. And he, he brought his dad in. Uh, his dad is Buzz Oates. If you're from Sacramento, like I am, and I grew up. Uh, I was the son of, de- of a developer, and my dad used to drive around and said, "Those are called Buzz boxes, Jeff." <laughs> and I didn't know what those meant when I was young, but I do, you know, do now. And all the things that Buzz had done. And he's a, such an icon in our community. So I'm going to replay with the uh, permission of the family, and they thought it was a, they, they were thrilled for me to do it, and I'm thrilled to do it. Replay that whole interview in, in, in its entirety next Saturday. So if you want to uh, to tune in next Saturday from 9 to 10, you will hear my interview that goes back to 2004-2005 with Buzz Oates. Buzz and Phil actually were both on there, and uh, kind of a little tribute to uh, to the guy who was a total icon in our community, Absolutely. and um, a lot of our uh, a lot of our industrial stuff that's built is, is, is built on his back. So. Um, I want to say uh, my condolences to the Oates family, but he lived a great, great long life, and uh, we'll replay that next week. So hopefully you'll tune in and join that, and we'll catch you the week after that. For John Fodorero, my name is Jeff Tarbell. We are live at Sierra Tahoe, and we'll catch up with you next week, everybody. Sorry for the, uh, the in and outs on the show. That's what happens goes live. We'll see you next week. Aloha. Talking money.